Heels welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heels is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heels was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Oops. thanks, uh, the organizers for and Sven for the for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about two things. I don't know how much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So I'm going to talk basically about two things. One is the role of reactive oxygen species in aging, and of course about mitochondria. So. So the, the question we, my, my group want to answer is how do we age? And answer how do we age is extremely important because if we want to find therapies, we need to understand the aging process. And we need to be careful because sometimes, sorry, sometimes something that we think is logical, maybe it's logical, but not true. And I think a good example is the mitochondria for radical theory of aging. So during long time, the mitochondrial for radical theory of aging was the most popular theory to explain aging. And it's, it was because it's a very logical theory. It has a very simple explanation, like as I said, with a very powerful logic. For instance, it says that reactive oxygen species, free radicals, produce as byproducts of normal metabolism cause the accumulation of oxidative damage. And the accumulation of oxidative damage is responsible for aging. And as I told you, this is a very simple logical explanation, but it's not necessarily true. Just yes, uh, a brief introduction about what is uh, free radicals. Free radicals is any kind of atom or molecule that has one or more electrons with our partner. And in aging, the most popular free radicals are, of course, reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species, they can be originated from outside sources, but also the body has places, the cells have places that they generate reactive oxygen species. The mitochondria is probably one of the places where more reactive oxygen species are produced because the mitochondria requires oxygen continuously to make, oh, to make its the main function. The main function of the mitochondria, or one of the main functions of the mitochondria, is of course the generation of ATP. So ATP, the food that we eat, is oxidized to simple equivalence, reduce equivalence like NADH and FADH2. And these reduced equivalents are further oxidized by complex one and two, and electrons are introduced to the electron transport chains. Uh, these electrons are going to release energy, and this energy is going to be used to generate an electrochemical gradient, a proton gradient, that is going to be used by ATP synthase to phosphorylate ATP to ATP. When it's not possible to extract more energy from the electrons, the electrons need a final acceptor. And for us, for uh, aerobic organisms like ourselves, oxygen is the final acceptor. That's the reason we need oxygen all the time. So once it's not possible to extract more energy from these electrons that are being transported, oxygen is going to be reduced to water with four of these electrons and two protons. And this happened at complex four. And complex four is extremely efficient doing this job. Never make mistakes. Never you have reactive oxygen species. You never have free radicals. However, complex one and complex two or complex three, they're not so good doing that. And they don't give four electrons to oxygen. They give one, two, or three. When you have one or two electrons, you have two low reactive oxygen species. In fact, superoxide and H2O2 they cannot cause oxidative damage by themselves. They are not reactive enough to attack proteins, DNA, or lipids. However, in combination with metal transitions like iron or copper, they can produce highly reactive 
oxygen species like the hydroxyl radical, and this is this hydroxyl radical which makes most of the oxidative damage. The point is something that strongly supports the mitochondrial radical theory of aging is the fact that during aging we accumulate defective mitochondria, mitochondria that they don't work properly. So this is an EM, an electron microscopy image from the fly muscle of the Sophila melanogaster. And you see the young flies have very round order mitochondria between the interfibrillar. But when the, the flies get old, the mitochondria get deformed, they are bigger, they are round, and they accumulate dense inclusions in the crystal state that prevent the mitochondria to work properly. So that would be in agreement with the mitochondria for radical theory of AM. However, in the last years, few groups have demonstrated that if you give, paradoxically, if you give a small molecules to worms that inhibit the mitochondria, that inhibit the electron transport chains and produce more free radicals, these worms, they don't live shorter, they live longer. And the same happens when you have mutations in some ETC subunits, in subunits of the electron transport chains, that increase the amount of reactive oxygen species produced by the mitochondria, but paradoxically, worms, flies, and even there is a mouse model, these animals, in spite of having higher levels of ROS, they live longer. Interestingly, recently, the group of Alessandro Federino published a paper where in a vertebrate, this is a fish, it's not zebra fish, it's another different species, they give to this fish rotenone, like other people have done in the worms, and the fish live longer. And this is a very remarkable result, although we don't know if with the doses, uh, they didn't present any data showing that this doses of rotenone is inhibiting the complex one or is increasing ROS production. The thing is that how we normally explain this contradictory result is very simple. The people just accept that low levels of ROS, they are positive, they have a beneficial effect, but high levels of ROS, they have a deleterious effect because they cause oxidative damage. So at the end of the day, the role of ROS being good or bad is depending only on the amount of ROS that you have. And I guess that most of the people will feel comfortable. This will be the comfort area where everybody will feel okay if we say that very high level of ROS are deleterious. But I'm going to try to show you today, or well, I'm going to show you some evidence showing that maybe where and how reactive oxygen species is produced, are produced, have also an effect on the physiological output of the ROS. And to do that, we need to move from the comfort area and go to the panic zone. One disclaimer is that all the results I'm going to present are in Drosophila melanogaster. So that means that this could be different in other model organisms, like worms or in mouse models, of course in humans. But something that is common in the flies and in other model organisms is the fact that when we get old, our mitochondria produce more free radicals. So this is the brain of two different wild-type species of flies, so they don't have any mutations. And as you see, let's say that one day in a fly is one year in humans. When the flies are 50 days old, they start to produce more reactive oxygen species. And they have more ROS. And this will be, once again, in agreement with the fact with the mitochondria for radical theory of aging. You have more ROS, the fly lives shorter because this ROS damages the mitochondria. But of course, these flies, they have many other different things apart of an increase in ROS. So what we wanted to do was make a fly, a transgenic model of fly, a genetic model of fly, where only reactive oxygen species are modified. And to do that, we didn't want to make mutations in the ETC because these have many side effects. So what we did is what we like to call an alternative strategy. And this alternative strategy is based on the use of alternative respiratory enzymes. Enzymes like NDA1, that is an alternative NADH dehydrogenase, able to oxidize NADH to NAD, the same than complex one. But this is a single polypeptide. Complex, complex one is 46, so it's much more difficult to manipulate. And we call them alternative because we don't have NDA1, and the flies don't have NDA1 either. But this NDA1 is present in all plants and fungi, and is used to fine-tune respiration. The interesting thing is when you put NDA1 in the fly, you have an extra place that introduces electrons to the electron transport chains, and this causes an over-reduction of the ubiquinone pool. And we know that when you over-reduce 
the ubiquinone pool with electrons. The ubiquinone pool is the electron carrier that communicate complex one and two with complex three. So all the electrons that are going to be used to produce energy somehow are going to be through the coin sign Q at some moment. When you over reduce the pool of ubiquinone with electrons, what happens is that you have that some electrons are going to leak and are going to produce free radicals. And this is exactly what happened in the ND1 flies. The ND1 fly, this is the brain, they have higher levels of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species than any other fly in the lab, including the very old fly that I showed you before. But surprisingly, the ND1 fly, they don't live shorter. They live much longer than the controls. And something that is remarkable is the, the manner they live longer. They move the same or even more. They are able to mate and reproduce and they eat exactly the same. So they don't have any disadvantage. Just to show you one example mo more of that they really have more rows, this is, we use a genetic encode reporter for mitochondrial HO2. And how the f the, now the flies are alive. This is the ND1 fly, they move, we slip the fly for the, for the video, and in this test, the most yellow is the fly, the most mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. As you see by eye, you don't need to quantify that the ND1 fly have much higher mitochondrial rows levels in vivo than the control. And it's, as I told you, absolutely fine. And we know that the ND1 flies live longer because they have more rows, because we did another experiment. Basically, what we did was use another alternative enzyme. In this, call, in this case, it's called AOX. It's an alternative oxidase. And once again, we don't have AOX. The flies don't have AOX either. But all plants and fungi use AOX. And what AOX does is something similar to complex four. It reduces oxygen to water completely with four electrons and two protons. But it does using electrons from the ubiquinone pool, not from cytochrome C. So basically, when you have NDA1, you over-reduce the pool of ubiquinone. When you have AOX, you keep the pool of ubiquinone oxidized. When you have both of them, the level of rods goes back to normal. When the level of rods goes back to normal, the positive effect of ND1 on left span also disappears. And that indicates that the ND1 flies live longer because they have more reactive oxygen species. And this is just to show that the model is working in practice. So if you analyze the amount of uh, coins and coup that is reduced, it's clearly increased after you express ND1 and goes back to normal when you co-express AOX and ND1. The point is that if we want to use this signal to extend life span in order First in flies, without using these enzymes, and then in other modern organisms, we need to understand how this signal is generated. And to do that, what we did was express ND1 in flies, that we now increase ROS a lot, and then we fed the flies with specific inhibitors of the electron transport chains. For instance, if we put mixotiazole, what we have is that complex three is blocked. So electrons cannot go this, and complex three is not going to be producing any ROS in this experiment. When we remove complex three from the picture, the ND1 flies still have a very high level of ROS. And that means that complex three is not the complex producing ROS in the ND1 flies. However, if we put rotenone, with rotenone we block complex one, and rotenone reduce ROS in ND1 flies. And that's an indication of how the ROS are being produced. The ROS are being produced because they, when the ubiquinone pool become over reduced, part of the ubiquinone goes back to complex one, and give, ele uh, give electrons to NAD to reduce back NAD to NADH. So complex one is going to reduce back NAD to NADH with electrons from the ubiquinone pool. During this process, a lot of reactive oxygen species are going to be generated. This mechanism is depending on the membrane potential. So if we give FTCP to the flies and we collapse the membrane potential, we also reduce ROS. And this is a confirmation that the ND1 flies produce more ROS by a mechanism that is called reverse electron transport. The next question we wanted to, to, to know is, is this reverse electron transport happening in vivo? And now there is a couple of uh, papers in high profile journal that say that that's the case, but it wasn't when we did this experiment. So we wanted, we hypothesized that if this red is produced in vivo, it should be possible to distinguish this red from the background, from other in a specific rows. So using the powerful genetics of the fly, what we did was knock down superox superoxidase mutase 2. So this is the only superoxidase mutation in the matrix. So when you knock down, 
what you, you have is that the levels of superoxide increase a lot. And this is just the test, so when we knock down so 2 we increase a lot uh, the level of superoxide in the brain. If we co-express AOX at the same time that we deplete so 2 we rescue the phenotype. The interesting thing is that when we knock down so 2 and this has been published many times before, the flies die almost immediately. But to rescue the phenotype with AOX doesn't help. The flies still die at the same rate. However, if you induce reverse electron transport and you produce even more rows, then you are able to partially rescue the phenotype. And I don't have the time to show you, but when you express this red, what you are doing is protecting the mitochondria. So complex one, for instance, is very effective in this slice, and any one is able to rescue, to protect the complex one and the mitochondria. So I think that shows that maybe we need to make or conform a little bit longer and start to think that where and how rows are produced is important to determine the physiological output. But also, we need to think which kind of rows we are talking about. And we did some experiments where we manipulate the levels of superoxide and the levels of H2O2. To specifically decrease the level of H2O2, what we did was target catalase to the mitochondria. So catalase is not normally expressed in the mitochondria, but we can add a mitochondrial target sequence and make catalase to be expressed in the mitochondria. When we have these slides, what happens is that levels of H2O2 are reduced, but levels of superoxide stay the same. And this is what we see here, right? Catalase in the mitochondria doesn't change superoxide levels, but it strongly reduces the levels of H2O2. When you combine nd one with catalase, all the beneficial effect of nd one in life span is uh, reversed, it's lost. That means that you need to have high H2O2 levels. Superoxide doesn't matter so much because we did another experiment where we overexpressed it too. Before we were knocking down, now we are overexpressing. And when you overexpress it too, you reduce the levels of superoxide. But you have a side effect. And the side effect is that you increase a little bit the levels of H2O2. And this is exactly what we have here. Low levels of superoxide when we overexpress it too, and a little bit increase in the levels of H2O2. When we combine NDA1 with SO2, the flies don't live shorter. So the effect is still there. So reduce the levels of superoxide doesn't affect the positive effect of NDA1 in longevity. That means I think clearly that the type of ROS is fundamental to determine the physiological output of ROS, but probably where and how ROS are produced can be also important. And this is something that needs to be explored. As I told you, there is uh, one recent paper in Cell where they show that the way macrophages are activated and produce inflammation is through reverse electron transport. And just to finish, I think we need to reinterpret this rod that we see here. So we have two possibilities. Possibility number one is that these rods are produced as a signal to allow the cells to adapt to some other kind of damage that is happening and is not rods related. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that these rods are in a specific, and what they are doing is masking the specific ROS pathways that allow the communication of the mitochondria with the rest of the cell. I think the problem is if you use ROS to communicate, ROS are great. It's like if you light a flame in the middle of the night. If you are the only person with the flame, it's very easy to communicate with someone that is very far away. But we, when you play with fire, you can make a big one. And when you have a big fire, use a flame to communicate is not useful anymore. Finally, I would like to finish giving thanks to people of my group, especially Filippo that produced most of the data, and some key collaborators like Danny and Plathi in Sevilla, Mike Marf in Cambridge, and Tony Enriquez in Madrid. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Sorry to ask any questions. I happen to work on uh, C elegans and uh, less enzyme Q. Uh, you did not mention that work. Uh, so we were uh, using mutant wor worms that do not produce their own uh, coenzyme Q. Okay. And, and we were uh, giving uh, it in the food. And so we were giving different levels. Mm -hmm. And when they had less coenzyme Q, especially Q enzyme Q10, uh, they were living longer. Okay. And at that time, we thought that it was because they were producing 
less react reactive oxygen species. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that now you have a totally different view. Um, so uh, I was interested because uh, later, now the Q10 is sold in the creams. So mm -hmm. instead of giving less, we give more. And it's supposed to be anti-aging for the skin, uh, with, of course, not much behind. Uh, so I would be happy to have your view of uh, the difference between NDY uh, in the flies and, and, and the nematodes, because it does seem a bit contrary to me. Yeah, so I don't know if I understand correctly your question, but in a, if I, this is something very important, right? A nice mention in my talk. This, what we are seeing could be a specific of the flies. So this red mechanism that allows to extend the lifespan in the flies, maybe it's not happening in other organisms. Red is happening also in, in, in mouse, and we know that, but we don't know if it plays a positive or negative role in longevity. With the worms, one thing that, uh, if you express any one in the worms, this is negative. It has a negative effect. Maybe because, paradoxically, and this is paradoxically because the, rot, the worms are very tolerant to depletion, complete depletion of superoxide dismutase. So it could be different. So that's what I mean. That Probably, you know, you need to adjust the level of ROS to have the, the, the signal. But just to finish with the coin sign coup, when you make a, in the worms, one of the problems I see in many of the stuff is published in the worms is that the worms many times, they live longer, but they live in a very bad conditions, meaning that they move less, that they, it, maybe not in this case, but in some models where they, for instance, make uh, mutations in electron transport chains genes, they are in a very poor condition. So they are not maybe living longer, they are living slower. And then it's a little bit tricky. I don't know your model. I, di I did see them, and they were moving quite nicely. No, no, I, I'm not. So I got into the. Future. Sorry, I, I'm not saying your model because I don't remember exactly the details. But in other models, that's, that's exactly what happened. Um, very nice experiments with uh, catalase. I wondered if you ever tried some glutathione peroxidide mimics. Uh, which would display a slightly different effect because they mimic the effect of the enzyme. Uh, no, we never try. The problem we will have to give that to the flies in the food, right? Yes. Which in, in theory is possible. In practice, you need to control that they, they are eating the same, that they are eating, that it's not metabolized before. So it's a little bit difficult. And I don't like to work so much with, uh, with, uh, with drugs that you need to supplement to the flies if I can skip, but what we could do probably is overexpress or knock down the, the enzymes. And that maybe will give us a completely different picture. So. Very nice talk. So I'm curious about, I mean, there's a theory that says that uh, the protostatic system feels gross mm -hmm. and then it triggers a response. And do you have any comment on that? I mean, uh, this could be a pathway because there's um, people involved in navigation. I mean, it's clear that they react to that, but there's no clear which is the pathway in which the protostatic system fills the rose in the, in the cell. So it is clear that the, the, the way that some proteins work, they require to have a specific uh, redox state in a specific cysteines. So if you start to have a lot of rows that are not controlled, maybe you start to affect these uh, cysteines, and this is what they start to cause problems, affecting protein stability and things like that. So I'm not saying that uh, all the rows are good, as in fact, I think that in a specific road ca can cause these kind of problems. And one problem that the mitochondria can have, if, if the mitochondria use this system of, um, of communication based on reactive oxygen species, and during aging you have in a specific rows, is that you need to be increasing the signal all the time. And at some, ta and at some point, you're going to start to affect proteostasis. So we have some model with another colleague where we saw that some protein that, feel, uh, that are involved in protein turnover, including autophagy and the proteasome, they have redox uh, sensitive cysteine that sends the level of oxidative stress and they become more or less active. So if at some point you have a lot of in a specific rows, this sense, you know, they are going to be, they're not going to be able to, to deliver the work and this can cause problems. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sands. Thank you.